Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Xi'an, for inviting me. Uh, I'm very happy to like uh, give a, a talk about our recent work that is on Bellman Illuder Dimension, uh, new, research, new rich classes of reinforced learning problems and sample efficient algorithms. As Xi'an already introduced, uh, I'm currently assistant professor at Princeton University. And this is a work about reinforcement learning. As you can see from the title, this is uh, like uh, we, we kind of like we want to move towards our understanding towards the unified theory of like reinforcement learning, generic reinforcement learning. Here we define a very rich class of reinforcement learning problem, which essentially already includes a, a majority of uh, like uh, tractable reinforcement learning problems we know so far. And uh, furthermore, we have designed a very generic algorithm so that we can solve any problem in this rich class. Uh, sample efficiently. This is a joint work with my student, Qinghua Liu and Sobham uh, Mar Maris Marisifa. I once, I once know how to pronounce his name, but now I kind of like a little bit forget. Uh, okay, and uh, so first page is uh, the picture of my amazing collaborators. Both of them are my students at uh, Princeton University. And although they are still quite young, I think one third year, one the fourth year, but both of them already have a very good set of uh, reinforcement learning results now. So I'm pretty amazed by them. And my talk would um, first consist of an uh, overview of, uh, of what is uh, what is the field and what is the main problem and uh, what is uh, our answer to the, those questions. Basically an overview of our main results. And then I will dig into more details about uh, what is the formal setting and how we define those rich class of problems. And eventually what is the generic algorithm that can solve any problem in this rich class. So first, uh, reinforcement learning. When we talk about reinforcement learning, we talk about uh, um, like a lot of applications in practice uh, which can be falling into the category of sequential decision making. Like for example, when we want to play Go with some other people or when this ro robot, he want to fold the towel and we want to do autonomous drive and uh, or even playing poker. So all of those applications share one common trait that is uh, we need to make multiple decisions uh, along the time. We receive the feedback and then we make another decisions and we affect the environment. Then we receive another feedback. So it's a sequential decision involved. And the major framework for, for doing that right now um, in practice for AI is uh, reinforcement learning. So when we talk about reinforcement learning. Uh, in theory, mostly we just talk about, uh, uh, we usually talk about a model called a Markov decision process. And I can explain the Markov decision process in terms of this uh, application where this robot is trying to fold a towel. So for Markov decision process, usually we have uh, two main elements. One is the agent, the other one is the uh, environment. Here, the agent is the robot and the environment is like uh, the position of the table, position of the towel and everything. So we have a state that is a current uh, configuration, current angle of, uh, of the, the joint of the robot and where's the location of this towel. And then the agent takes some action. For example, he can like move the towel to here or he can like change some angle of his joint. And then the agent affect the environment. Environment will then will move to the next states and, and issue some reward to the agent. And the goal of reinforcement learning is we want to find the best policy so that maximize the cumulative rewards. So in this scenario, the reward would probably just be one if you success, successfully fold the towel. It will be zero if you fail to do that. So the best policy to maximize the cumulative reward means like you want to find the best way so that best way for the robot to fold the towel as fast po as possible and, uh, and with, with like a higher probability to, to be successful. So this has been the goal of reinforcement learning uh, has for a very, very long time. In fact, this area has been there for like decades. And uh, for a very long time, uh, like for the classical literature of reinforcement learning, people has been talking about uh, achieve this goal, that is find the best, best policy to maximize the cumulative reward without too much consideration about competition and the sample. So they prove results so that it says if you have infinite amount of samples, you have an infinite computational resource, and then you can achieve this goal. However, in modern reinforcement learning, we know that would be not be the case. And uh, in fact, in practice, uh, efficiency is the most important thing, or it's a very important thing. So when we talk about efficiency, we usually talk about two types of efficiency. One is a sample efficiency, and that is we want to use as few samples as possible. And the reason, uh, you can think a lot of reasons. One can be like collecting samples, it could be very time consuming, like, like when you want to play Go. If we want to play Go with expert, expert that would take hours. 
And uh, cracking samples can also be very expensive. For example, you want, you want to do autonomous drive, and uh, if you crash your car, or th that would be super expensive to, like, uh, to repair it. And on the other hand, computational complex efficiency is also very important. For modern reinforcement learning, we usually train a very large neural networks as a representation, and then we train some reinforcement learning architecture on top of that. So training usually will take weeks, if not months. So I would just take an alpha go zero as an example, which, which is an, like a reinforcement learning agent tra trained to like uh, play this Go game. So the algorithm, they do actually train on more than 10 to the seventh games. And the training, one path of training usually take uh, one month. So this is like a very, very huge projects. And anything, if we can say theory, we can improve uh, the sample efficiency or we can improve the computation efficiency by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100. All of them would be a huge, has a huge impact in practice. So this is about efficiency and what we know about efficiency in reinforcement learning. So it turns out current theory, most of the theory of reinforcement learning knows uh, about those efficiency questions uh, in a tabular setting. And by tabular setting, we, we mean the reinforcement learning setting where the number of states and action are finite and small. So it, like, like in this chess game, well, it's, the states is not that small, but, but at least it's, it's finite, it's countable, and, uh, and uh, we can like, uh, enumerate all of, all of them like, in some reasonable amount of times. So the strategy of this tabular reinforcement learning is, uh, of course, if the states and action are finite and small, we can, we can just visit all of the states and visit all of, try all of the actions. And then I can learn directly. So this is called tabular setting because I can like, uh, I form a table for all the states and actions. And it turns out there are abundant theoretical results for this tabular setting. And, and also even the minimax optimality results has already been known like minimax optimal algorithm has been designed and the lower bounds, the matching lower bounds has been proved. And for example, there are a bunch of work like Azat Hall, they did something for the first near optimal algorithm called uh, VI with value iteration with upper confidence bounds. And we also have some papers in 2019 uh, about some Q-learning with upper confidence bounds. And one very important feature about this line of work is uh, the sample complexity to learn this tabular case you need to scale linear respect to the number of states. Because the strategy is basically, I visit all the states. So the, the, the sample complexity scale is linear with the number of states. However, in practice, um, a lot of times uh, we cannot do such an algorithm. So we cannot use the tabular setting results. Most, uh, the biggest reason is because uh, for a lot of practical problems, the number of states is really huge if it's not infinite. For example, like uh, if you want to say StarCraft, like each pixel and the different colors and different positions, they are like huge combination of this number of, of, of the states. So if you really want to count the number, it's uh, easily going to be greater or equal to 10 to 100. So there's no way you can, can like enumerate all of the states like in some reasonable amount of time or even in like 100 years, a thousand years, something like that. And during the training, when we play StarCraft or when we play some other, like reinforcement learning problems, and the most states are not even visited once. So here, the strategy, we can no longer just try, say some tabular strategy, we will visit all the states in action. Here, what are we gonna do is, uh, okay, we hope, although the states are, are very, number of states are very large, but we hopefully they are kind of like, they're similar, they have some underlying structure, and those structures is, uh, is uh, captured by our parametric class, function class F so that I can approximate the value of policy by some parametric function class F. So in practice, usually we do it by neural networks. And we know neural networks has a reasonable amount of parameter, usually like uh, thousands to millions of parameters, so that at least it's not something like 10 to the 100, and uh, it's something like we can still do like in a week or in a month to, to like approximate those value and policy. It's like supervised learning setting, we want to have some parametric function class. But reinforcement learning problem is definitely very different from supervised learning problems. It, it has a lot of temporal correlations. So introducing this function approximation here actually introduced a lot of uh, challenges uh, in reinforcement learning setting. First one is like generalization. We, as I said, uh, mo for most applications, we cannot visit a state even once. So we need a mechanism so that I can generalize the knowledge from visited states to unvisited states. 
also now because I, I limited myself to some like a parametric function class, so I have limited expressiveness. I cannot express all the functions. And uh, this will introduce a problem, like for example, if I doing some operation like Bellman operator or some other stuff uh, in my algorithm, I easily end up with some function that is outside the function class. And then I need to do some projection and those sort of things are very hard to that are very hard to deal with in theory. And finally, a big, the biggest difference of reinforcement versus supervised learning is uh, we also need to, we not only need to like do some planning, we also need to do some exploration. That is, we need to actively pick which policy I'm gonna execute in my current episodes so that I can collect data. So I choose the way to collect the data. And here then we, we always need to deal with some exploration versus exploitation trade-off. So all of them makes uh, function approximation in reinforcement learning theory uh, rather difficult. So it turns out uh, even till nowadays, uh, most existing theories still focus on special cases and on their very strong assumptions. Those special cases are like a linear approximation, that is a value function would be approximated by a linear function. And uh, LQR, which is a very basic control problem, linear quadratic re re regularizer, and all of them makes it very different from supervised learning, which recall we, in supervised learning, we kind of like we say very generically uh, for any function class, as long as the uh, random map complexity or VC dimension is small, then I can learn them with some generalization error bounds and with some guarantees. So this is essentially our question in reinforcement learning. What is a minimum structure assumption that will empower sample efficient reinforcement learning? By minimum structure assumption, we we kind of like we won't have a generic complexity measure like red, something like red amount complexity or something like VC dimension, so that we can see as long as those are small, and then I can learn it. And by sample efficient learning here is like uh, we want to ask this question as a first step. We want to make it a sample efficient. That is, uh, we can learn it in polynomial samples, and the computational efficiency would be something of future interest. It's also very important, but but it will not be addressed in this work. This is definitely some very big questions we can ask in reinforcement learning area. And it's always, uh, it's not that easy to find the minimum structure or, or maybe you cannot even find what is minimum structure. But what we can do is we can further our understanding on this problem by doing following two things. The first one is I can identify a rich class, very rich class of reinforcement learning problem. By class being rich, that means I impose a very small, like very weak structural assumptions. And hopefully those rich class of reinforcement learning problems will include a lot of problems uh, where, we, where we use in practice. And so that the rich class is like general enough. So, so study this rich problem is, is general enough to cover a lot of practice, practical problems. And the other one is of course, it's not enough to just identify a class. Most important thing is we want to say this class is tractable or sample efficient learnable. And so it's important to design a generic sample efficient algorithm so that I can solve any problem for this class. And uh, in fact, this, this talk, we'll, we will just address these two problems directly. So before we talk about our results, I would like to first say about what is known in this reinforcement learning field in a little bit more details. As I said, there are some basic settings like uh, tabular MDPs and the linear MDPs, which you do linear function approximation and basic control problem like LQR. Um, but there are also some more advanced settings like reactive pole MDPs and reactive PSRs and uh, like generalized linear MDPs. So it turns out like you can see like by the name, those settings uh, seems like very different and there are a lot of different specialized algorithm designed for those different class. So it turns out there are already like two prior work, I would say in this area, which did a very good job in like organizing or those unifying those theories. One is uh, doing low Bellman rank. And he identified a new class of problem, which, uh, which as long as uh, the the problem has low Bellman rank, then you can learn it efficiently. And the other one is a low eluded dimension. And with a completeness assumption, we will talk about it in the late later. So both of them like include a subclass of uh, tractable problems we know in reinforcement learning. However, those class are, are definition, they seem very different. And also the algorithm to solve those class also seems very different. So we're wondering whether there's a framework which we can unify them. And also what is really the important thing that makes a reinforcement learning problem tractable? So it turns out this is a, how we define a new complexity measure. We define a new complexity measure called a Bellman eluded dimension. So you can see somehow it, it used something about eluded dimension, and, uh, but it applies to the Bellman narrow. So we call it a Bellman eluded dimension. 
it turns out that this this class new class is a superset of uh, um, those ge generic class uh, we have already known to be tractable, and turns out even like in in the in uh, for a lot of other pro reinforcement problems, you can also prove it's also in our class. So it contains I would say to now almost all the existing tractable reinforcement problems um, by our low Bellman eluded dimension new class. And furthermore, we have a generic algorithm for this new class. One is we call it GARF. It's a new algorithm we designed based on optimization. And it's a, it's, it's a surprisingly simple and clean, I will, I will describe in later in this talk. We can, I can even describe it in just one page. And it's a standard algorithm which uses similar philosophy as an as a algorithm to solve bandit problem that is with optimism. And furthermore, this alg algorithm, although it's very generic, but the regret and sample complexity result also very sharp. It matches or improves the best existing results. Those existing results uh, are only for the subclass, but we can even match or even beating them, those results. And secondly, we also have an algorithm, which is uh, uh, some adaptation of uh, prior work by Jiang et al. And uh, though those, this algorithm is based on hypothesis elimination, and we provide a new class, and we show and the algorithm is not only work for this giant how work is for the Bellman low Bellman rank. And we show this algorithm is not only work for Bellman rank, but also work for our new rich class. Okay, and this is an overview of uh, this talk. Uh, any questions? Uh, feel free to interrupt me. And otherwise, I will I will go towards some details about the uh, settings and uh, the definitions. Okay, uh, so formal setup, um, we will consider, as I said, a Markov decision process. And to be specific, I will talk about episodic Markov decision process. That is, uh, we have a states, collection number of states, a uh, collection of states, collection of actions. And we have a transition probability. That is, uh, suppose I start from some state action and, and what is a distribution that I will end up with the next states. And also I have a reward function that is uh, based on the current state and action, how, how much reward I gonna have. By episodic setting, I mean so each, uh, each, uh, each, each reinforcement problem will end, always ends in H steps. And then I, this is called one episode. And then I will start another game or I start another play and from the beginning. And we're, we're in the exploration setting. So we, we need to address exploration by the, in a sense like we, we don't assume we have simulator or we don't assume like we already have some smart data set or like very good policy that collects a very good data set for us. All the data I must collect by myself. And also I assume that the, the setting, I uh, assume the problem always start from some fixed initial states. This is just uh, some for theoretical simplicity. And the agent is only able to take actions. We're not able, allowed to teleport to any states. We're only able to pick actions and whatever states I can reach is uh, purely by my actions. It's kind of like, you can imagine it by playing a game, I always start from the same states and whatever I do, I end up with something. And so I cannot like jump to some lay, later stage of the games, uh, I cannot cheat or like by teleporting to some other place or something like that. But just a question. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, from the picture, it seems like the sequence of the states is always the same. X1, then X2, then X3, or is That's it the case that X, 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 Two just represents that, and you can you can have multiple. Oh, X two, yeah, X two is just as a representative of the state has the second step, okay. second step. You can I... be a lot of different states. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good question. Thanks. Um, okay. Then, then we can uh, after after we talk about Markov decision process. Uh, I think it's uh, it will be convenient for later develop to talk about some important concept of Markov decision process. The first one is a policy. That is, uh, by policy, in Markov decision process, we just mean a map from state to action. So for example, if my current state is x2, and then what is action I'm gonna take? So it's kind of like a map from x2 to, to, to a2. And we also have a value function that, that, that it is defined as a cumulative reward starting from some step h um, and for from a state that is uh, like we say, if I start from state S and I do the policy pi and start from step H, this is my value function V. And I can also start from a state action pair instead of a state. So this is my value function Q. And those are like, you can, you can, you can, ex, you can 
think of this value function as uh, something you would expect uh, starting from here and uh, what is a la later value you're gonna get. And uh, with this knowledge, with this language, we can talk about the object of reinforced learning is I want to find the optimal policy and the optimal policy in a sense, I want to maximize the value of initial states uh, with policy pi. So I want to find the policy pi so that uh, start from beginning, my cumulative value would be the maximum one. Like you can imagine in a game, I want to start from the beginning and uh, after following this policy pi, I want to win as many times as possible. So th this kind of thing, okay. And uh, now if we, we can say um, the objective is to find a optimal policy and we can even prove actually in under this setting we talk about, there always gonna be exist an optimal policy and this optimal policy V star will introduce the optimal value Q star. That is, uh, it take this pi, policy pi to be pi star. So it turns out this uh, optimal value pi star will satisfy the so-called Bellman optimality equation. That is my value function at h steps will equal to the reward, an immediate reward I'm gonna collect. And then the value function at the next step where the state is going to be sampled from the transition distribution that condition on my current state and action. And uh, the action in the next step I'm gonna take is a maximizing over them. And I will call this as a Bellman operator. And uh, this is a little bit technical, but uh, I just want to say it because our new definition is actually very key, depends on this Bellman operator. And it turns out this is also very important in equality in the reinforcement learning. And of course, this is a Bellman optimality equation. So it says for optimal value function, it satisfies this Bellman optimality equation. Um, but if uh, on the other hand, for in the function approximation setting, for example, if I, I don't have the optimal function, but I have some other value function, so it turns out I can define this Bellman arrow. So in this case, uh, I will not end up Bellman arrow with zero, but with some maybe positive or maybe ne ne negative Bellman arrow. So Bellman arrow is basically just a value function at h steps minus the Bellman operator times the value function at h plus one steps. And uh, I will notice uh, there are several things important. One is of course, so on which function you take the Bellman arrow. And the second is which step. But also most importantly is uh, those uh, Bellman e optimality equations defined for each state and action. But however, for reinforcement problem, like uh, for single function uh, value function, we want to say something about uh, for the entire reinforcement problem. So I want, don't want to say it for a, a, a vector. We want to say it for under some expectation of the state action and subject to some distribution so that eventually my bell and arrow become a one scalar. So another thing very important is, so what is the distribution you're, you're taking expectation over for this Bellman arrow, Bellman residue, okay? And finally, when we talk about function approximation, we just means uh, we're given a function class. It's very similar to supervised learning. We're given a function class. And, and because this is episodic setting, so I say my function class, I have F1 to FH. Uh, this is not, not that, that important. You can also say I have only a single function class that for each step, they are the same. And my function, value function, will consist of h functions, that is a value function for each steps. And I, my hope is uh, I will have one function in this function class that will approximate the optimal value function. And that is q1 star to qh star. And there are two common assumptions people will make in a function approximation setting. One is so-called realizability. This is actually a very important assumption, which I would say almost all the existing theory will hinge on. Realizability means uh, I will say my function class is uh, well specified. So it's not misspecified in, in a sense, the optimal value function is in fact lies in our value, uh, our function class. The second one is completeness. Uh, it's not quite necessarily. So it turns out the, one of our algorithm does not require completeness. The other algorithm required mainly for the, for the algorithm, uh, mainly for the algorithmic reason. And so what a completeness says is uh, it says, uh, my function class, uh, so whatever the function I, I have for the, next, for the next step, h plus one step, after I take the Bellman operator, it will lie in the function class of my previous step in the h step. So this is kind of like saying, if I take the Bellman operator, I will not end up with some function outside the function class. It is also a common assumption in a lot of uh, algorithm, but we, we kind of like we say it's not quite necessary. So those are the basic knowledge about reinforcement learning and uh, any questions so far? Okay, 
Good. If no questions, I think then we will we will like uh, move on to our a, a quick a quick question. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So we, so we sorry. started with finite state spaces. Here you're talking about general state spaces. Yeah. I, I, Is there I'm, any I'm, any structure on the state space that you require? So I think uh, so. As I said, like the. Uh, so the structure assumption about the states required is kind of like enforced in the, the, the this function class. So for example, if if uh, my function class is a li li linear function class, then I'm saying my optimal value function has to be li li linear by realizability. It's kind of like a very strong assumption about about my structure of state space. Okay. So it kind of implicitly in this function approximation. That's function. the realizable. Part. Realizable assumption, yes. Right, but but I mean just the state space itself. Let's say. It can be anything. It, it, it can, we, we didn't it make can anything. be anything. It yeah. doesn't have to be like continuous or compact or uh, in, like in a linear function case. Like we say, it's uh, we can we can we can do a li li linear map, and mm -hmm. after that, uh, we also don't require it to be compact. Uh, it can, as long as it's bounded, we don't we don't need to be like compact or something. Like that. Okay. Well, oh, but the function class hinges upon your Bellman operator, right? Uh, for now, it, 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 that, that, that does not, but later we will say our definition it, it depends on the Bellman operator. Right. For now, it's just, you can think it's like a linear function or whatever it is. But, but yes, you're right. Like says, it says like if a linear function is realizable, then it says something about MDP. That is Bellman operator transition or rewards. Yeah. It's, not some, it's not only a property of function class, but also like about the MDP. I, I see. So then I guess the next question is, is there an efficient way to understand the function class given a specific Bellman operator? Uh, is an efficient way to understand a function class given, a, oh, it's, yeah, you're saying it's, it's, is it function. easy to check whether it's uh, realizable, yeah. for example? Yeah. Uh, right now, I would say no. <laughs> it's, it's more like a, a theoretical assumption we made. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on to our key definition about, about new, new complexity measure we're talking about. So in order to first talk about Bellman eluder dimension, I need to first talk about what is the eluder dimension. It turns out eluder dimension is introduced uh, in a seminar paper by, um, um, by Daniel Russo and uh, Ben Roy in 2013. So you can, you can view eluder dimension as something like uh, similar to VC dimension, shard, shard factoring dimension in like supervised learning, but, it, but it's also a little bit different. It has some online fe fe feature. So I will explain what is, what is uh, this definition. So in order to say a little dimension, we first need to understand the concept of a point being epsilon independent or being independent. So we say point Z here is independent of a bunch of earlier points X1 to Xn, respect to some function class F. If there exist uh, at least two functions, that is F and G, so that I would say F and G on any points Xi, that is on the set X1 to Xn, on any set of xi, they are very similar, so that even the cumulative, uh, the, the summation of a square loss on those two points, they are less than or equal to epsilon. You can, you can think like those two functions are basically the same on, on, those, on those endpoints. Even though they are same on these endpoints, they are still different on this point z. So then I'm saying this z is independent of uh, all the previous points. So in this picture, you can also view it. So I have a function class, and I suppose all those four functions are in my function class. And those four functions are kind of like very similar in, in terms of value in both x1, x2, x3, and x3, 4. But those functions are very different at a point at z. So in this case, I can say, I can, I can easily pick any two functions out of this four so that they will te testify that the z is actually independent of, um, of all the previous point x1 to x4. And what is eluded dimension? Eluded dimension is more or less defined as uh, the length of the longest sequence x1 to xn, so I will figure out a, a sequence of points x1 to xn, such that uh, we can ignore this part. So basically, we're saying there, there is some epsilon prime, which is greater than epsilon. And the most important thing is uh, I, the property of this sequence is uh, any points will be epsilon prime independent of all of its predecessors of all the previous points. So xi will be independent of x1 to xi minus 1. Okay, so what, it, what this means, uh, like this sequence I can add is, uh, for example, if I already have x1 to x4, then I can only add an additional point, something like z, so that at least z is independent. Then I have five points, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, that is z, 
Then I can only add an additional point probably here, x6, that is independent of all the previous points. Um, so this would be a little bit abstract to understand it, but, but I think more this, uh, this is talking about some independent component or independent points in this, uh, in this space of characterized by this function class. Uh, it's, it will be much easier to understand it by some examples. For example, when, when we, we can talk about the functions on, on discrete points. So this will be used for like, for example, when we want to prove multi bandits. In this case, my points would only, I only have like finite number of points. That is, I only have like, uh, for example, A points. In multi bandit, I only have A different arms. So I have A different points. And I define my function class to be any function so that uh, function value will be less or equal to one. And in this case, you can imagine the, the independent sequence, like the longest sequence to be independent is basically, I just pick a single point for, for, each, for each different arm. So in this way, I can have A different points. And this is my Euler dimension. And uh, to be a little bit more complicated, we can also define and uh, consider this concept in the linear function class. And linear function class, basically, I look at the space where x is uh, bounded by two norm, uh, bounded by one. And my function is a linear function, so that my weights is also have two norm bounded by one. And it turns out you can think uh, uh, one way to pick this independent sequence is I pick the orthogonal basis for each direction. And uh, this is one way to pick the independent sequence. And because now we have some epsilon relaxation about this independent definition, so it turns out the longest sequence we can, we can figure out is not only d, but d, d to the log one of epsilon. So I have some uh, additional logarithmic slackness. But basically, the, the thing captured about the, the independent component in linear function, in linear function space is also dimension d. So um, I would say this if an uh, eluded dimension is something um, that would replace about something like uh, about how many how many uh, yeah how many independent components like in the all the online uh, online banded community like when we want to do proof we all have, always have pigeonhole principle we say like how many buckets we have and uh, how many independent components we have so the dimension is more like generalize this concept to nonlinear or like a more generic setting. I think Any there's questions? a question from the audience. There is a yeah. question. Please. Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you just go back to the definition? Um, mm -hmm. So here, uh, like, uh, so for this sequences of point x1 to xn, mm -hmm. you're basically looking at um, the L2 norm indifference. That has to be less than epsilon. But So this is not point-wise. So it might be the case yeah. that in in one of the points of uh, like the functions are really far apart, right? But no, uh, any then, points must, must be smarter than epsilon. Any points must, must be smarter than epsilon because this is a summation of the square loss. I see, I see, that's true. Yeah, so so, so point-wise, yeah, it's stronger than average. Uh, average is actually stronger than point-wise. Right, okay. Good, very good question. Um, yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, I also have a question. Actually. Yeah, please. So, so like, is there any does this definition have anything to do with the statistical independence where we are looking at the decomposability of joint distributions? Uh, I would say the connection is not direct. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't think I see any direct connections, or like if any direct connections is known in the field mm. about this. Yeah. I, th I think this is more like, a, as I said, online learning about pigeonhole principle about independent component that kind of thing. And also, mm -hmm. by the way, the, the, uh, by by the look at it, you you will, you will probably also feel it's uh, kind of like similar to, in some way, similar to fat sh shattering dimension in supervised learning, but still the relation I think is not clear in in, in the community. I see. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, according to this definition, if you have like a sequence of point, uh, a large number of points x1 to xn, where the families have the same, all the functions in the family have the same value, mm -hmm. then then no matter what happens uh, in other parts, so this that family is going to have a very big. Eluded dim dimension, right? 
uh, if you have a lot of points that are independent, like uh, if I have a very long sequence that that, that, that that each point is independent of predecessor, yeah, that, that have, will have a very large eluded dimension. I think this is more like uh, talking about in function class, how many how many degree of freedom in some sense like uh, you, you can have. If you have a lot of points, they, they can be independent, then yes. You have a lot of degree of freedom, so this class is like much harder to learn. I see. Yeah, but 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 I think more this uh, this this is something about degree of freedom, but also it's in an online fashion, so that it is not saying like this x i x j is coming from some data distribution, but uh, but uh, you can allow it to be any sequence of data points, and that this will be the longest sequence. So it will be the longest sequence of independent mm -hmm. points. It's kind of corresponding to the online learning where we can we can smartly add some points which are independent of previous points. But we cannot control what what is order and what is underlying distribution. I see. Okay. Phil, just a quick question. Um, this is a kind of worst case scenario, right? You're worst case scenario is the, because in practice you would probably expect that all those trajectories are much, in a sense, they will be much more narrowly confined than just taking the worst one from the class. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I will also say this is a uh, uh, this is something like uh, slightly different from online learning learning versus supervised learning. Where like right now in our setting of reinforcement learning, we kind of like we say we, we don't have any like expert helping us pick data, so we have to pick the data data set ourselves. We have to execute a policy ourselves. So in this case, my my policy I figure out in the T T episodes would probably depends on all the previous randomness, and in that way, like I really have very bad. Um, statistical independence, uh, like in the world worst case. So that's why we make this assumption. But I agree if you can s s like some, do somehow splitting of some independence things and probably there's something bad, better you can do. Okay. And all those are very good questions, thanks. And so- So sorry, another question here. So go, go ahead. getting back to Arya's question here. Mm -hmm. um, so if the function class would have boundary conditions, uh, uh, that are have, have a, what boundary conditions? <clears throat> yes, say a, a boundary condition on a curve or a surface. I mean, anything higher than uh, one dimension, right? You would have an infinite number of points that would all be infinitely close, right? Um, and um, where the function would be infinitely close, right? Um, uh, no matter, right? Well, no, I, th I think that this definition is saying like. A uh, in the, being independent is kind of like saying being some function being close in like a, in in like a, a hundred points does not necessarily imply uh, they are being close to to the next point. So they need to be independent in some sense. You you cannot say like the of course there are some. I see. Okay, I get it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, good. And so after we understand this uh, eluded dimension, and then we can talk about what is the Bellman eluded dimension. So it, in fact, it's, uh, it's not that difficult. It's, we're kind of like doing some uh, like generalization and to apply it to reinforcement learning. So we only like do two modifications. The first modification we do is uh, we, we define the so-called distributional version of eluded dimension. So we're no longer talking only about points, but we're also talking about independence in uh, the distributions. So in this way, I'm no longer evaluating a, a function on the points, but I'm evaluating a function on distribution depends on the expectation taking over the distribution. So in fact, and we say that distribution mu is epsilon independent of this new one to new n. If uh, the functions is very small, so, so here I am seeing one function instead of like some function difference, but those, those differences are like very minimal. You can ignore that difference. So I'm saying if the function is very small in all the evaluating on all the distributions here from new one to new n, then this will, they will, this will not say anything about the expectation on mu is also small. So in fact, the mu can be large. So in this case, it's, we call the distribution is independent. And then we can also say the distributional eluded dimension is basically depends on the longest sequence so that uh, as, as I, uh, it's the same thing as earlier, the distribution must be independent of all its predecessors. And very, one very important thing is uh, after we talk about distributions, then we need to talk about the family of the distributions. So this will be a new parameters in my eluded distribution or eluded dimension. And the reason we talk about this distribution or eluded dimension is because in reinforcement learning, especially in the later steps, 
it's not necessarily easy to 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 like evaluate something in a single stage or something, but it's uh, roughly easier to evaluate it in some distributional class. So we will see that later. Late later. But for now, you can see this is a generalization of standard eluded dimension. Just basically, like uh, the difference is like uh, first. Can I, can I copy for a second? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so I'm a little bit lost with respect to this first definition. Like there, before there were these x's, mm. and I understood that. But now you have these new distributions, and, and and these news indicate what? I, I'm I'm I'm. Oh, the distribution over x. Sorry, a distribution over x. Okay, I see. So you instead of single points, you're talking about whole distribution. Whole distribution, yeah. You, uh, you can view a previous definition as like a direct distribution on single points. Right, right, right. And okay. Now I generalize yeah. to a more distribution. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, and uh, you can see if uh, this uh, distributional class actually include all the direct di distribution on single points, then I recover the original eluded dimension definition. Mm -hmm. So so this is generalization. Right. And uh, with this, this generalization, then uh, it's very easy to define our Bellman eluded dimension. Basically, it's just uh, this uh, distributional version of eluded dimension applies on the Bellman residue. So, so we're, we're not looking at the function class itself, but we're looking at the Bellman residue. The, the Bellman residue in, in, induced the function. The function class induced by Bellman residue. Where the Bellman residue is defined as uh, FH is my value function at H step minus the Bellman operator times FH plus one. Okay, and uh, as I said, the Bellman arrow has two component. One is like what is function you take Bellman arrow. Second is uh, what is uh, distribution you take over SA, and the, the, this this lambda is a distributional class I'm gonna control. So I my my B dimension Bellman eluded dimension will be depends on this two parameter. One is uh, what a function I'm gonna take the Bellman arrow, and the second one is uh, what is the distribution my Bellman arrow is taking over SA. And this is just max over step H, which is not important. You can also make it average over H or whatever, but it only pays some fact, polynomial factor of H. It's not that important. Okay. And uh, so for this definition, we have uh, a lot of uh, distribution class. So this distribution class can be a lot of different things. It's very difficult to, to bound anything about distribution in like the Bellman eluded dimension. But for the purpose of reinforcement learning specifically, we will talk about two class of distributions. One is the visitation map measure or distribution over current state action that will generated by executing a greedy policy with respect to function, function in the function class F, which is a standard way we do it. So, so what does it mean? Like currently we have a value function class that is F. So the value function before each step, I can take a greedy function, a greedy action with respect to this value function. This will define a, a greedy policy that will parameterize by F. And then this policy, because I execute on this MDP, this policy will induce a distribution over all the state actions, like how, how much distributions for each, like one, one half probability to visit these states or like some one third probability to visit some other states. This is a distribution class that we'll consider. And the other distribution class I will consider is all the direct distribution, as I said, like all the singleton distribution that will focus on uh, each essay pair. Those are the two distribution class I will consider. Okay. And basically this is a definition of a Bellman eluded dimension. And it turns out this definition is very generic. As I said, there are several class um, people already know like Bellman, low Bellman rank and a low eluded dimension. And for the, for the time's sake, probably I don't have enough time to talk about what is uh, this, those definitions are. And those are in prior work. But what we can say is as long as Bellman rank is small, then we can say the our Bellman eluded dimension is also small. It only will be it will be upper bounded by the Bellman rank times some logarithmic terms. And as long as the eluded dimension itself is small, and under the completeness assumption, where this completeness assumption is used for all the prior works in this class, like they need to prove some efficient results, we can also say the Bellman eluded dimension is small. So basically, we can say this low Bellman eluded dimension is a super class will inc include like all the prior complexity measures in these pictures. And uh, like uh, the most important thing we want to say is that this class is uh, like so rich so that it contains a majority of known re reinforcement problem that we know is learnable in polynomial set samples. Okay. Um, good. Uh, if, you, if you don't, if you don't like uh, 
learn this new class very clearly, it doesn't matter. We, I will introduce an algorithm, which algorithm is very simple to understand. And the algorithm actually, you can understand this algorithm independent of the, this complexity map measure. So in order to introduce our simple algorithm, sim sample efficient algorithm, I, I, will, I want to reveal a little bit about the upper confidence bound algorithm for multi-arm bandit set setting, and then we can establish an analog. So for upper confidence bound for multi-arm bandit problem, in a multi-arm bandit problem, for example, here we have four arms, and then we just want to identify the, the best arm, which is with the maximum mean reward. So in, in, the, in the algorithm, we typically maintain a confidence interval for each arm. That is, that indicates like uh, what is uh, my mean reward is gonna land in there. And uh, the upper confidence bounds algorithm consists of three steps. The first one, I'm gonna pull the arm optimistically. That is, I have the highest upper confidence bound and highest upper bounds on the confidence interval. Second, after I pull the arm, I'm gonna collect the reward. And third thing, after I collect the rewards, I'm gonna update my confidence interval for all the arms. And then I'm gonna repeat this process again and again. So it turns out our algorithm, generic algorithm designed for this reinforced learning also following the same three steps. The first one is we do optimistic planning. So we will have a confidence interval, a confidence set. So now it's no longer a confidence interval for each, each arm, but I will have a confidence set for, for this function class. And I will, I will first find the, the best function in this, in this confidence set so that it will maximize my value at the first step at the initial states following the greedy policy. And then I will make my policy, I'm gonna execute at the case, case episode to be the greedy policy induced by this function, by this value function. By mean like for, for each state, so I just take the argmax of this value function. And the second step is again, after I have the policy, I'm gonna execute the policy and collect the trajectory. So now I'm no longer only just collect one reward, but I collect the entire trajectory. That is the first stage, the step in first step, and action in first step, and then the state in second step, action in first step till the H step. And finally, I'm gonna update my confidence set. Okay, so it's just uh, these three steps. And uh, finally, I'm doing some online to batch conversion, so I, I will make the output policy just uh, some something simple uniformly from all and the, all the previous policy I'm gonna play from from episode one to episode K. So the key idea here is a so-called global optimism with local confidence set. We want to emphasize here, the very important thing is that we do optimistic planning here, but we only do optimistic planning in the very first step. We don't do any optimistic planning in the later steps. So this is what we call op a global optimism. This is very different from like other like a previous algorithm, which you can imagine by doing dynamic programming, you need to do like this uh, optimism in all the steps. So you can like stack all the, confidence bound together. But then if we only do the global optimism, how are we gonna say something about a connection between H plus one step to H plus step? Those, those things will be all be reflected in a confidence set. Uh, I'm gonna introduce in the next slides. So the confidence set is gonna be constructed based on each step, but the optimism is like global optimism. So this allows us to have a very simple algorithm like this. So how we construct this confidence set? And first, the confidence set will be a intersection of the local confidence set in each step, H. And what is a local confidence set? And one principle you can imagine if you don't want to say something about confidence set, but like you want to have a point estimator, is for example, if I know my function value, uh, my, my value function at H plus one step. So I probably want to estimate my value function at H steps by doing minimize the Bellman arrow. So here the Bellman arrow is defined as uh, something like a value function at each steps minus a reward and a value function at the next step. So you can think that this is like an empirical approximate of the Bellman arrow at each step. And then this infimium over my function class is doing something like ERM. This is a, give you a point estimator. But however, like this is a, like online setting, as I said, I like a, similar to the upper confidence bound, I, I'm not only want to a point estimator, I want to have a confidence interval. So the way I, I construct confidence interval is saying, my current value function is not necessarily just the ERM, but it can allow some arrow to be slightly greater than ERM. So those are in terms of statistical arrow. So as long as in, in, within the statistical arrow level, I think uh, those value functions are still possible to be optimal value function. So they're just slightly worse than ERM but they can still be the optimal value function, okay? 
So the com confidence set we constructed is just a relaxed version of ERM with some confidence le level beta. And uh, typically, we choose this beta to be scaled with logarithmic with, with this uh, function class f. This basically explains uh, our algorithm. Again, we just have a very simple step where the confidence set is constructed as a relaxed version of ERM. So our th main theory kind of like says, uh, as long as we have a reliability and completeness, those two assumptions, then our algorithm GORF, uh, with, without any other assumptions, we don't need any like a uh, exploration assumption or any, any other thing like data, data set. We can do exploration ourselves and the GORF algorithm is able to output an epsilon optimal policy within this number of episodes. That is uh, H square and D log and F and epsilon square over epsilon square. Where D is this um, Bellman inverted dimension, we have introduced this Bellman inverted dimension with two distribution class. That is, one is a direct distribution, the other one is the, in the, the distribution introduced by the function class, executing greedy policy of function class. So now we can say whatever any definition, a, any Bellman inverted dimension is small, then our algorithm can solve it. So it's a minimum over these two, two type of distributions. And then the NF is uh, the covering number, law covering number of uh, of the function class f, in the in the standard case where or in the like where where the function class is, has the only finite element, this is basically cardinality of f, and we only pay the law cardinality of f. No, it's like law covering number. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, just it, it's hard to to unwrap all of these, but what does the algorithm need to store and manipulate at each stage? Uh, so, and so I think I think as I said, several elements. First one is uh, we, I think we, we need to like ma maintain a confidence set B. That is uh, basically uh, we have a function class F, and uh, confidence set is more or less uh, saying like uh, after I observe a lot of data set, after a lot I observe a lot of trajectory, I know some some value function in my function class will definitely not be optimal so I can throw them away. And the confidence set is basically says uh, what is the remaining function that I believe can still be the optimal value function. That is a Q star we want to approximate. So it's a, it's a, it's a single function or it's a set of functions? It's a set of function which will be re represented by the data. So the set of function that uh, satisfy oh, the, the, oh. those constraints. I see, I see. And okay, the constraints so is basically the, the the Bellman arrow of my current function is uh, no greater than the ERM plus some, some relaxation. I see. So I see. Okay. So basically, this is the only thing we need to maintain. And everything else is we just compute the optimistic function in this class. Yeah, I also want to comment out. It's a, it's a very good question. I also want to comment out. This is, a, as I said in the beginning, this is like sample efficient algorithm. So this is not computational efficient algorithm. So it's not clear how to compute the argmax here. So there are two things uh, computationally inefficient. One is like computing this uh, ERM. We know in general for, for general loss, ERM is, is, is definitely not, not, not computationally efficient to, to compute. And second thing is how, how we solve this, uh, like how we do this optimistic planning, like do this argmax. All of them can only be do approximated maybe in practice. Okay, yeah, feel free to stop me if you have any questions about this. So I guess you need completeness so that the confidence bound is still within your functional class, right? Yeah, yeah. We kind of like uh, need need this ERM to work. work. Otherwise, the ERM might 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 be in some other function class, which which uh, does this relaxation is no long is not is not enough to just pay some log covering number of f, but some other function class. Okay. Um, can you come? Can you comment on the dependency on different parameters like h and epsilon, like um, compared to right. like usual settings? What are the, there? The, this? Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say h and epsilon are pretty sharp here, actually. And so basically, epsilon one of epsilon squared is a standard statistical rate, uh, which you cannot su surpass that. And uh, the h here we have is uh, is basically because some normalization things. Um, just because uh, we we kind of like under normalization, we assume each step. Uh, rewarding each step of reinforced learning is kind of like bounded by one. So for one episode, the value will be upper bounded by H. So you can think the epsilon optimality, this, this measure itself will contain some scaling respect to H. 
and here this the the the, the polynomial of h and epsilon kind of match. So basically, this h is a is a scaling that contains in epsilon. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I will also say a little bit. Uh, the there are also some regret guarantee we can get. So we not only have some pack guarantee, like just find some optimal. We can also guarantee like during the entire execution of my algorithm, um, my policy will not be very very bad. And in, in terms of uh, if I if I execute it for k episodes, the regret will be scaled with something like eluded dimension squared eluded dimension, and the k is the number of episodes and the log covering number. I guess uh, there, uh, there are, yes, there are a lot of uh, technology and uh, terminology here. Um, but if you have, still have something unclear, feel free to ask. But I think the ma main message I want to convey is uh, the scarf algorithm. Although it's very simple, but it, it can learn any low bounding rooted dimension problems sample efficiently in polynomial samples. And furthermore, this sample efficient sample complexity is like pretty sharp. Uh, uh, if no question, I will also say a little bit about the sharpness compared to the prior work. So as I said, and the one thing we can consider is a linear function approximation, which uh, which uh, the sharpest result is given by Zanetta Zanetta 2020, and there they get regret. And so our result uh, in that uh, reduced to that setting we will have h d linear and square root kappa regret, and this will match the net algorithm. And it turns out this this has been proved to be minimax optimal. So in the linear function approximation setting, we're actually sharp. And in the low eluded dimension setting, we get this regret. We will improve our prior work by square root of dimension and the eluded dimension. And for low Bellman rank, we will also, they don't have regret and they only have sample complexity. So we also can compare our sample complexity with them. We actually improve over those results by one factor of Bellman, low Bellman rank, Bellman rank. So actually our result is sharper by, and then those results but uh, the final result, low Bellman rank, they don't require completeness. So this is uh, one drawback of our algorithm. So this also raises another question whether we can do something without completeness. It turns out also, yes, we can basically just modify his algorithm and it's called Olive algorithm. And uh, Olive algorithm does not require completeness. It's only require realizability. And then we can also find epsilon optimal policy, but the algorithm is slightly more complicated. It's also based on the hypothesis elimination, so I will not uh, explain it here. And the most important thing is it also can learn everything in polynomial samples. Specifically, it no longer has some linear dependence on the B dimension. It has only, it has a quadratic dependence on B dimension. And also we can only deal with DF instead of D delta. So we just do a quick comparison where compared to the GORF, it has worse sample complexity. It also can deal with only like a weaker version of Bellman eluded dimension. It does not deal with family class that is D, D delta. It also has no regret guarantee, but how, however, it does not require completeness. So two algorithms kind of like uh, com complementary to each other. And that basically concludes uh, my talk. I will just uh, do a very quick conclusion. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask afterwards. So the, the summary of this talk is we define a new rich class of uh, tractable reinforcement problem that is called low bounding root dimension. And as I said, it kind of contains almost all the existing tractable reinforcement problem we have known how to solve so far. And we also have a like, single unified uh, generic algorithm. We can solve for any problem with low B dimension. And the algorithm is kind of clean and simple. And we also prove the radius, statistical radius is quite sharp. And then we also have a new simple analysis for Olive that will, that will be also for a general low B dimension class. And there are definitely a lot of future directions along this more direction about the general function approximation of reinforcement learning. One is about we can, whether we can identify some richer class of tractable reinforcement problems. And also the other one, so can we prove some lower bounds about sample complexity? Finally, uh, one thing I haven't touched at all that is competition efficiency. How we can, now we have a generic rich class, how we do the competition efficient algorithm or Oracle efficient algorithm for those kind of settings. And that will be all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I thank you, Chi. Uh, other questions for the audience? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, th thank you, Jerry. Very nice talk. Um, I, I have a sort of. Um, I, I, I'm curious uh, whether you think that um, 
So, so the, the theoretical setup is very nice. You have this uh, new version of dimension that, that somehow allows you to bound the complexity. But um, in some sense, I, I guess we've been kind of going away from notions of complexities like that in supervised learning, away from VC dimension, because we kind of understood that many classes like neural network have very, very high VC dimension. Mm -hmm. but they still can be opti So there is something about optimization which is not captured by notions of dimension like this, like the gamma or yeah. whatever. I completely agree. So we're talking about in supervised learning, there are, there are possibly also some data dependent complexity like margin bounds or some other op optimization or something captured capture by that. Yeah, uh, not even margin bounds. Even, even, even margin bounds don't really work like what is okay, realized. Yeah. Uh, but the margin bounds are closer to data dependent, but re really like complexity based on optimi somehow on the output of optimization itself. I, yeah, I'm I, just I think like, do you have any- I completely thing? agree. I also, I also have read some paper you, you, you have like on that kind of line for explaining deep, deep learning. And I would, uh, my personal thought would be, I think uh, for reinforcement learning, we're not there yet. So, so I think we're still at the stage of uh, trying to do something similar to VC dimension or something like that. I would say even there, we are not fully achieved that. So I think uh, there's one thing I, I kind of like, I feel like really troubles me is about this re realiza realizability assumption. So in supervised learning, we don't, we don't actually require it. We, we, we can do any, a lot of uh, agnostic, uh, agnostic learning result. But in reinforcement learning so far, this still is a bottleneck of almost all the results we, we know so far. And uh, just because two different two problems are different. I, I would say still there are a long way to mm -hmm. to build this theory for reinforcement learning, yes. Yeah, I mean, it is a much more complex setting. M many yeah. more moving parts somehow. Yeah, but I concur with it's, it's a very, It's a very good future direction to think about. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess we, we asked a lot of questions during your talk. Uh, <laughs> okay, sounds cool. Uh, yeah, um, if you have any questions offline, also feel free to ask me, show me email or something. All right. Um, so if there are no other questions, uh, yeah, let's thank Shi again for his excellent talk. And thank you, yeah, uh, also th thank you for inviting me again. Yeah, bye -bye. Our pleasure. Okay, uh, see you guys next week then.